Welcome back to the gathering room, which today appears to be the in whole a, dungeon in the holding cell. Yes, in a Turkish prison. Um, <laughs> the fabulous Rowan Mangan is here. Hello, hello. I also caught show, show them your beautiful hair. Oh, but I've not done my hair for the occasion. Okay, well, it's always done. This is this is Rose hair, and I call her the gracious. I am my pajamas. She is the gracious badger. And I want her to put out a, a, a magazine called Gracious Badger Living. Anyway, I took down the painting from back, behind me last week because a lot of people said it was very, very distracting and perhaps a little bit annoying. So it's gone. And that's the appearance of the Turkish holding cell. <laughs> but we'll move next week. We will move next week because the holiday, well, one holiday is over and our many guests have gone home and we miss them, but that frees up a little space as well. So hello everybody, hi Donna, hi Wendy. Wendy and Donna continue their race to be the first to show up. Mm -hmm. But now we have, ooh, and Kareen from Lillehammer, Norway, woo! Terry from Portland, Oregon, Casey from North Carolina. Oh my gosh, um, I love our international crowd. We are intercontinental. Carolyn, Kara, Wendy from Breckenridge, Colorado. Woot, 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 woot. Um, I'm excited for today because I've been reading a fabulous book. So 10, oh, we are over the 100 mark. Woohoo! Okay, we're gonna get started on this. This is one of my favorite topics. For my birthday, which was this week, and I'm not even going to try to hide it because, you know, Instagram. So, yes, it was my birthday this week, and I am older than Methuselah. But I was given many fabulous presents, among which was a book that talks about how people survive in conditions of extreme danger or endurance, like being lost in the jungle or caught in an avalanche and all of that stuff. And the thing that is so delightful is that the author, his last name is Gonzalez. I forget his first name, but it's called Deep Survival by somebody Gonzalez. So he not only talks about exciting adventures where some people died and some people lived, he also talks about the brain structures and the way the brain operates so that some people are more likely to survive difficult situations than other people. And the first section of the book pleased me more than I can possibly express because it, it said two things. In a dangerous situation, and let's face it, we all, you know, if you drive a car, you are frequently in a dangerous situation. In a dangerous situation, the two things that get people killed, that make people sort of lose, lose the plot, first, they disassociate from what's actually happening. So they start to rely on, say, a memory of how traffic usually works instead of the fact that a car has just come straight through a red light and is now barreling at them. They're like the brain goes, no, that can't happen. And because we're not present in the way that an animal might be, we don't react to that speeding car. We react to the way we hope it will or we expect it to, to behave. So disassociation and not being really present in the situation is the first thing that will get you in trouble. The second thing is simply fear. As fear goes up, your ability to think logically and respond appropriately goes down. And we all know what it's like to choke or to freeze um, in, a, in a dangerous situation. Now, that's a part we all know, but the, the fix for those two things, for not being present and for fear are my favorite things. The first is playfulness and the second is dark humor. How awesome is that? And this is why, for example, when you go to see thrillers, the heroes, while being pursued by the Kraken or whatever, are always turning around and making jokes. Like they're doing this pitter-patter dialogue with the villain to, and, and like wise cracking out of the side of their mouths while people are shooting at them and everything. And there's a part of us that loves watching that, even though I think it is not at all realistic. I think very few people are that funny in the face of danger. But we love it because instinctively we know that remaining playful and funny in a dangerous situation actually does things in the brain 
that make us more likely to survive. So when we're playful, like when you're out playing a game of pickup football with your kid, um, you, you move any which way, you jump up in the air, you dive for the ground, you're just relaxed and active. That is presence. And presence, that kind of playful presence, means that, for example, people who are skiing, if somebody's headed for a tree and they're thinking, oh my God, my life is on the line, they may freeze and go smash into the tree. But if they think, this is so fun, oh my gosh, I'm dodging obstacles, they're more likely to remain in a state of responsiveness that allows them to avoid the danger. So playfulness is really, really important. The second one, dark humor, it's more of a psychological survival mechanism. And I want to talk more about that in today's gathering room than about physical playfulness. Because more of us are in a situation of psychological danger, I think, perhaps than those of us who are in physical danger. So what, what humor does is it actually transfers some of the energy that would go into t imagining dark outcomes, it takes it over into invention and playfulness of the mind. And it's actually a different part of the brain than the part is that is responding to pure fear. So it moderates fear. A certain degree of fear will help stimulate you, but too much fear will freeze you. And being funny helps keep you in the range where you're not frozen. You're aware of the danger and you're responding to it, but not in a way that's going, that allows fear to get the better of you. So I was thinking about how dark humor has worked for people that I know. Um, for example, take Winston Churchill. He was, he was a depressive, okay, so he had frequent bouts of depression, if not continuous bouts of depression. He drank too much. He was, living through, leading Britain through the darkest period of its history. And he still was cracking jokes all the time. Um, if you'll pardon the uh, expletive, one time somebody came and told him one of his generals wanted to talk to him and he was on the, he was on the potty. And he said, tell him I can only deal with one shit at a time. Sorry for the word. But, and he, he described Charles de Gaulle as someone who, he looks like a llama or a llama surprised while bathing. And more famously, he said, when you're going through hell, keep going, which is good advice, but it's also kind of funny. He had that ability to do the dark humor in the face of the worst obstacles. Um, another person I was thinking about was the, the writer David Sedaris. Uh, so talk about dark. He's been through some really dark things, but he is so funny. And in his book, Me Talk Pretty One Day, he talks about going into an immersion program in, in France when he went to live there with his husband. And they had the, it was a horrible experience. I know, I've been in a Chinese language immersion program. I know how hard it can be. And he talks about how they would huddle together and have conversations that you would think were coming out of a refugee camp. So they, and they all had to speak what French they could. And he translates it directly. So he says in his book, somebody goes, uh, but sometimes me cry alone at night. And he, for someone else says, that is normal for I also, but cheer up you with much work, someday you be loved. I mean, I'm not sure if that's exactly the quote, but it's very close to that. Look it up, it's hilarious. Now, when you're going through these things, they are not hilarious. They're not funny at all. In fact, <laughs> I don't tell someone who's going through a hard time that it's going to be hilarious. And I, I have asked Ro the gracious badger if I could please tell a little story. Uh, she used to have very long black hair, very dark brown hair. And then one day she decided to cut it all off. And I do mean all. We shaved her head down to about that long. And then we bleached all the color out of it and she wanted to dye it blue because it was that kind of a day because it was a Thursday. And so we went and got some blue dye and we dyed her hair blue. I'm not going to show you the one picture she took, but I will say that we were expecting, expecting a kind of gentle ocean blue. And what we got was literally this color here. <laughs> It was it was Rubik's Cube blue. And when she saw it, she was not gruntled. 
she was seriously disgruntled and we had to drive we were living at the ranch so we had to drive like an hour into town to get more blue. we'd already cut her hair <laughs> bleached it out dyed it blue and now we were like oh and, and by the way we were going shopping for houses we were getting on a plane the next day and coming here to, in, to this house that we're now in to one shop. wanted to make a good impression one wanted to make a good impression and she's one like not going to make my it hair good. is rubik's cube blue this is not working so we drove and drove to the store and she was like ah. she had a scarf like she looked like a, <laughs> like a babushka and um i made the horrible mistake while driving to the to the pharmacy to get more hair dye of saying Someday, this will make a really good joke. Don't say that while it's still happening. <laughs> no! The Kraken was released. <laughs> and then we ended up getting like some orange hair dye and putting that in with the blue. I'm going to use this on the gathering room someday. And it came out kind of brown. And we got here to this house and the realtor took one look at us and rolled his eyes and like wandered off hopelessly and then was completely shocked when we made an offer. <laughs> All of this just to say that if you're going through a hard time now, don't just think of it as being rough. It is rough, I grant you that. But somewhere in the back of your mind, tuck away the information that the harder the experience is now, the richer it will become as a mind for comedy. In fact, comedians say that comedy is pain plus time. And when I've written two memoirs, right? One was about my son being diagnosed with Down syndrome before he was born. And another one was about uh, me dealing with a very difficult childhood and leaving my religion and my family of origin, and like losing everything I loved. And through both those times, while I was living them, I was taking notes and writing things down. And I was thinking someday, like this is so horrible <laughs> that someday it's going to be really, really funny. And I couldn't imagine that happening. And yet, as you go through the periods of darkness, the difficult times, you will find that in between the despair and the weeping and the agony, sometimes you're, when you're with someone who loves you, who's sitting there crying with you or who's just giving you a big hug, there will be times when the, the agony eases and right there in the middle of it, you come up and you go, oh, you know, at least, I, at least I'm not still in Chinese class. You know, I mean, that's not funny, but you'll end up saying something that is a little bit pitched toward the droll. And in those times, you start to see the tiny, tiny point of light at the end of the tunnel. So, while that's happening, first of all, I, so you know I always get to this prescriptive part. The first thing is to file away the notion that dark humor is a survival mechanism for difficult times and that the more difficult the time, the, more, the richer it is for later enjoyment, as bizarre as that sounds. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is learn to actually exaggerate in order to be humorous. For example, as I was preparing to come to the gathering room, I went upstairs, I got this scarf to cover the brand name on the sweatshirt I'm wearing. <laughs> and I was coming down the stairs in the dark. <laughs> and I thought, I can't really tell one stair from another. And I thought I got to the last stair and it turned out it was not the last stair. No problem, I just, jutted out one nimble foot and landed on a rug, but the rug did not have a pad. Whoop! I did the total banana slip, and I just lay there, twisted my ankle, smashed my backside, and I was like, I just looked up to the skies and I said, oh, you think this is funny, don't you? Like, it, it was as if I just finished this sanctimonious sermon on how to make happy times out of sad times, and it's like, <laughs> laugh at that. Yep. So now I'm laughing at it. But exaggerate the details 
and it actually starts to become funnier. If you ever have the privilege of going to Africa and hearing some of the South Africans tell stories of their encounters with animals in the wild, you will hear things that will make your hair stand up on end. It was so awful. And they are so funny about it. And part of what they do is exaggerate the story to, in a way that is deliberate, not to lie, but it actually pumps up the humor. And then finally, oh, and then wait, 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 wait. If it's not funny yet, don't say it's never gonna be funny. Mark it in your calendar. On this day, I did not find this situation funny. I will look at this day and mark the day when it finally brings a joke to my mind even if it's somebody else's joke. I remember when I was pregnant with Adam and it was, I was absolutely devastated. This was like a, maybe a week and a half after I'd heard the diagnosis, I was six months pregnant. And I was like, the implications for what that meant about me as a mother and how people would treat my child and all that, my life, it was just horrific. And I have a cousin who'd been through some really tough stuff of her own. And she came to see me and I was like, oh, you know, I, people are going to come up to me and they're going to and they're going to say there's something wrong with your baby. And, uh, and she said, yeah, they probably will. And this is how you respond when they come up and say, and she played both parts. She was like some somebody coming up. Well, miss, I couldn't help noticing there's something a little weird about your baby. And then she did the part of me and she's like, oh, my God, you're right. And we just cracked up and we, and I, that was the first laugh I had about that awful situation. And then it turned out to be a book in which I, that I had a tremendous amount of fun writing and in which I made many jokes. Um, so wait, wait, and the humor will grow. And the last thing is just remember that by choosing to nurture black jokes, dark humor in the worst of times, you are actually removing yourself as a victim by putting your brain in the state of creator. This isn't something that was in uh, the Deep Survival book, but it's something we've talked about before, that the, the one single thing you can do to keep yourself out of a victim situation is to become creative. And there are two places where the verbal part of the, rain, of the brain um, is, sorry, where the verbal skills are handled by the right side of the brain, which is more creative than the left side. Left side is more analytical, generally speaking. The right side is more creative, generally speaking. But in two areas, the right side of the brain takes over using um, words. The first of those is poetry, and the second is joking, because it's more like music. It's more like art than it is like just talking. So that's what I have to say about laughing all the way. And if you're having a rotten holiday, because this can be an awful time of year for a lot of us, start to write things down so that later, even the darkest moments can become some of the funniest things that ever happened to you. I know that sounds weird, but just to cap it off and bring a little spiritual twist to it, I wanna quote Reinhold Nybar, who said, laughter is the beginning of prayer. And I believe that's true. When we join with creation and making a joke in a tough time is an act of creation, we reconnect with the creator that is the essence of all of us. And we reconnect ourselves with compassion, with deathlessness, with love. And that's what we're here to do. So any questions or comments are very welcome at this point. Um, so, oh, yeah, I see one that, um, <laughs> I see one I like, sorry, this is supposed to be, I like this. Um, would you read that for me, Ro? My eyes aren't good enough. I've been told that sarcasm is hostile, so I avoided it at all costs, which I just realized has caused me to lose the adaptive nature of the dark humor you're referring to. You know, that's a really good point, Kristen. And one thing that I always told my children and myself to do is make sure that you're the butt of the jokes, but also don't make any of them cruel. If you can't be funny without being cruel, that's cheap humor, it's easy humor, and it's not actually creative, it's just mean. So if you can find a way to poke fun at yourself in a way that seems joyful, then do it. 
If you're being hurtful to yourself, you'll feel it. Don't do that. And if you come up with a sarcastic, mean, bitter piece of humor, that's fine. Mull it over in your head, but see if there's a way you could make it kinder and, and sweeter because that's the way the universe is playing with us. It doesn't want us to be hostile to ourselves, but it does want us to have fun, even with our egos and our hurt feelings and our hurt everything. So that's an awesome point, Kristen. I really appreciate that. More questions. Um, what? The other way. Oh. No questions there. Oh, Ro is telling me how to do this. Yes, please do. Uh -huh. I'm singing the I'm a lumberjack song. Um, oh, yeah. This is something that I already said, but it's worth repeating. Um, if you're going through stuff and you want to do some gallows humor, that's fine. But when somebody else is going through it, don't even try to make it funny. Like, just commiserate. My cousin would be an exception, I would say. You know what? I'm going to make an exception to that based on the reason she was funny when other people might have been insulting. And the reason was that she had been through hell and found a way to be funny in the middle of it. She'd lost her father to a god-awful disease when she was only in her teens. She had to make the decision to turn off the life support machines. She'd been a single mother. she I, I mean, she'd really, really been through it. And she was funny through all of that. I'm going to disagree with you there, Martha. I Please don't do. think what you've been through qualifies you to make jokes at other people's expense. I think it's about the relationship and what you know about them. I don't think that you get credit for what you've been through in a way. Yeah, that's, that's not what I acted. What I, was, what I meant was the way she brought the humor to it because she'd been through it felt really gentle and compassionate. Because, but she has to know you to do that. Yeah, I think she it's would really have to dangerous yeah. for someone to go, something bad happened to me, I'm going to make yeah. jokes about your terrible life. I think that's but, the point. So I think she started by making jokes about her own terrible life. And then it kind of got me to the point where I was willing to be funny about my own. I, I agree with Ro on this. And this is why we have fact checking and backup on the gathering room because I am often dead wrong. You coaches know that my favorite phrase is tell me where I'm wrong. Okay, so, oh wow. Ah, there was somebody who was in a car accident. It's such a long quote that I'm not going to put it up on the screen because it would block the whole screen. But um, she's been through a car accident and she says, this is Cheryl. She says, I'm not in the dark humor part of it, but I feel profoundly grateful that I'm still alive and that I found a new use for mindfulness. You know what? Just saying, I'm glad that I found a new use for mindfulness is getting you to the place where you're making light of something really, really scary. You're already on the way. And you notice how the way Cheryl said that, she brought gratitude to it. We talked about gratitude before Thanksgiving. If you bring gratitude for the situation, it's interesting how humor is right on its heels. And um, just remember that this is not something that I'm admonishing you to do because it's morally correct. I'm, I'm piggybacking on some studies that show that humor actually minimizes fear and a lot of psychologists think that love and fear are the two major impulses of the brain that there's attraction and avoidance and, and everything breaks down into those two and in general attraction based emotions feel wonderful and avoidance or fear based emotions feel horrible so by making light of things i'm not saying that you'll be a tough hero or that uh you'll, you'll be a better person what I'm saying is that you won't have to suffer from quite as much fear. And that has been a, a really powerful survival strategy for me when I was in emotional danger of really going under. If I could be grateful and then start to bring, it, bring humor into it, what happens is that the fear goes down and fear is suffering and it makes us do stupid things. So, um, let me just show you. Here's an interesting comment from Katie. She says, my friend with constant suicidal ideation created a brilliant live comedy talk show called Mental Illness and Friends. It helps her and others immensely. She also wrote a one-woman dark comedy play about her experience with depression 
and electroconvulsive therapy that had some absolutely hilarious zingers. Oh, oh, was that a pun, <laughs> Katie? Because that was that was pretty. Uh, Ro often tells me there is no such thing as a funny pun, but I really appreciate your making one. Uh, yeah, I really would recommend that you go look at at, um, at YouTube and check out some comedians who make light of their pain. One of my favorites, who is the sister of our uh, master coach, Sarah Seidelman, who is also hysterically funny, by the way, um, is Maria Bamford, who has a severe mental illness and spent some time uh, being institutionalized and has to be on medication. In fact, her whole career was collapsing um, because she had a breakdown on stage while she was really doing quite well. She was a really rising star. And then she had a this total breakdown. And she ended up living in her parents' attic, with, having lost everything. And from her parents' attic with maybe a camera and a friend, I don't know if there was anyone else in the room, she started putting something out on the internet called the Maria Bamford Show. And it was, it was about her breakdown and about how she'd lost everything. And it was sweet and dark and sad and hilarious. And she put out these like three minute videos and she did a bunch of them, like 20 of them. And I became instantly addicted to them. And so did people in Los Angeles. And she ended up having her own Netflix show as a result of the fact that she could go through this awful experience. Like mental illness is no joke, right? Well, if you're in the middle of it and you can find humor in it and you can show that example of courage and intelligence and buoyancy to the world, then it really does bring light to all the rest of us who are dealing with less horrifying things. So yay for comedians who deal with awful situations and for all of us who in awful situations make funny. Um, somebody liked the mark your calendar advice. Uh, Shannon says, what if sarcasm is one's modus operandus? I find it hard to trust people who are chronically sarc sarcastic. It can be like a disinvitation to communication and relationship. Yeah, sarcasm, I've been told that sarcasm is 90% um, genuine hostility. Like say um, you're talking to someone and you think they you know, don't exercise enough. And they say, I'm going to go, I, I need to go for a walk. And it's like, and sarcasm would be, oh, yeah, like that's, like you're such a gazelle. You're always doing the walking. It's mean. Sarcasm is mean. And it's a language I try not to speak. I was kind of raised speaking it. And I learned to speak it well in college. But I started to avoid it. Uh, at about the time, probably when Adam was diagnosed, I, I realized I had no more use for sarcasm. And there's a softness that comes from humor that finds the truth about pain, which is that we are being changed and taught. I want to go back to um, what Cheryl said about her car, car accident. I'm really grateful I found a new use for mindfulness. There's nothing sarcastic about that. Where sarcasm is 90% real hostility, genuine healing dark humor is 90% love. Genuine, honest, open love. And sometimes we can use humor to just tweak it a little so that it doesn't become sentimental or so, so that we don't start to pity ourselves. And by making a bit of a joke about it, we can, we can get that spirit of buoyancy into the dark without lapsing over into just sentimentality. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody, somebody wrote in that she, I'm gonna hide that one, that she used to play Boulder Dash with patients, in, with the other patients in a psych ward. Um, I, know, I know a friend who grew up very poor in a family of 13 Catholic children in, in Detroit in the freezing cold. He and his brothers and sisters used to go out and play a game they called, I think it was Buzzy Bee. They would, the only toy they had was a ball of rags and they would soak it in gasoline. And then they would go stand in a circle, 13 children, and set the ball on fire and then kick it at each other. And 
if your clothing caught fire, you were out. <laughs> and the circle got smaller. And then they kept picking and picking until there was only one child left who had not actually caught fire. So there's another example of people going out and playing in a being very playful in a very difficult situation and then later telling stories about it. When he was telling us this story, a room full of people, we were like laughing hysterically. But the only Christmas Christmas present he and his 13, his 12 siblings had was a ball of rag soaked in gasoline. He was still gonna make it funny later on. So I'm very grateful to all of you for joining me for this gathering room. I'm very grateful for the gracious badger, Rowan Mangan, who allowed me to tell the story of the electric blue hair. And I hope that if you're having a bad night tonight, that you write it down, put a, put a mark on the calendar and say, there will be a day when I will laugh at this. And by doing that, you put yourself back into the stream of compassion and creation. So have a wonderful week. I love you all. And I'll see you soon. Bye.